This Week in Science and Education is presented in association with the Science Coordinators and Consultants Association of Ontario. Visit their website at sccao.ca. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you in part by the University of Western Ontario, www.uwo.ca. We thank them for their support. This Week in Science and Education is also brought to you by Laurentian University. Check out Laurentian at laurentian.ca. We thank them for their support. Hi everyone, welcome to This Week in Science and Education. I'm Nicole Tate-Hill filling in for Kevin Kugler. Uh, this is episode 81. As always, I'm joined by Thomas Merritt at Laurentian and Colin Jago with Kawartha Pine Ridge District School Board. And we have Dan Weaver here from the University of Toronto. He's going to tell us all about atmospheric physics and his research. So why don't we get right in there. Dan, why don't you tell us a bit about your research? Uh, well, uh, most recently uh, I was up in the Arctic for about a, a month uh, on Ellesmere Island. We've got uh, a lab up there uh, called Pearl. Uh, it does some really w wonderful world-class uh, measurements and, and research into ozone depletion, uh, climate change, uh, and, and into pollution. It gets transported up there uh, from all over the planet. So it, it was a fantastic experience and, and really something that uh, I think is important to Canada. So Dan, let me ask you a question right off. I, I was reading through your bio in the blurb and, and the, the, the measurements that you're making now are awesome. The, the problem that I'm looking at, how much data do we have to, to go from? I mean, do you, do you have any long-term data that you can, can compare to? Can you extrapolate back? How do you decide where we are compared to where we were to get an idea of where we're going? Right. In terms of, well, the lab itself has been in operation uh, for about 15 years. Uh, different people were operating it uh, until from 97 to, to the mid-2000s. Uh, a group of universities took it over uh, in 2005 and have been operating it since then. And then, so we look at that data and then can compare to uh, work that's been done in, in other ways. But in terms of our actual record, uh, we've got about 15 years. And, we, and what do you find it? I mean, get, is 15 years enough time to see trends? Or if it's longer, and, and maybe that's at question one. And then question two mm -hmm. is science is really bad about funding anything longer than three to five years. How do, how do you guys handle that? So one, what are the trends? And B, how are you going to pay for this? Uh, excellent questions and really hitting the critical two points that have been on everyone's mind here, uh, especially as of late. Um, and, and I'll get to that yeah. in a moment. Um, well, one thing that we you know, did get a lot of publicity around uh, last year uh, was we've been looking at ozone depletion. And last year, for the first time ever that we've seen, we had, we had a big ozone hole in the Arctic. Uh, people kind of going through school learn about the ozone hole in Antarctica, and that's been a regular seasonal phenomenon. Uh, but we didn't expect to have that same phenomenon in the Arctic. And so it's really important to be looking. Uh, and the fact that we were there looking uh, enabled us to see this. And then, of course, the questions are, are just kind of coming through as to why did it happen then? Uh, will it happen again this year? Uh, I don't want to comment in, in a final kind of form. Uh, the data seems to suggest it didn't happen uh, this year, and, and that leaves us really wondering, and, and we really motivates us to keep this uh, type of observation going, and that leads to the funding question. Funding's difficult. Uh, the funding for Pearl uh, expired two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> So this is something on everyone's mind. It's part of the well-publicized, I don't know what you call it, uh, rearrangement of federal yeah. funding. Um, there's a lot of avenues people are, are, are trying to pursue to keep this open. Uh, we, you know, we even had an outpouring of support. This got a lot of media attention. Uh, when we just got back from the Arctic, they announced things weren't, weren't going to necessarily be funded anymore. And we had $12,000 donated from Canadians uh, around that have read the news articles and said, this is the type of work we really want people to yeah. be doing, and if the federal government's not going to support it, we'll, we'll show our support. And so there's, well, it really comes down to the federal government programs, and, and we've applied to things, and we're very hopeful to continue, and I think that we will. Okay. Mm. Um, to Colin? Yeah, no, Dan, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm 
we sort of we sort of dove right into sort of the the, the political climate a little bit here, which which is unfortunate. Yeah. Um, it, and it, it, I mean, it's it's an, it's unbel it's it's embarrassing, quite frankly. I'm going to say that as a as a Canadian science teacher, it's embarrassing what we're doing uh, uh, as a country. Um, but can I get us to back up a little bit? Yeah. You, you mentioned that you were up there doing some some ozone monitoring and and pollutant yeah. monitoring. Can you get maybe yeah. maybe to to talk a little bit about what it is you're monitoring, what it is you're looking for, right. uh, and kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts about how you're going about doing the research that you're doing. Uh, we've got a whole suite of, of instruments there. Um, so we've got very high uh, quality spectrometers uh, that uh, take measurements uh, using a method where we basically look at uh, the solar radiation. So we've got all these instruments that, that track the sun, and as the, as the sunlight passes through the atmosphere, uh, it interacts with different molecules, uh, and then by the time we, we get it in our instrument, we can look at that uh, pattern, uh, the spectral features, and then calculate uh, what was in the atmosphere and, and whereabouts it was. Uh, I've been looking most recently at, at some of the water vapor stuff. That's been a big question in climate change science, and, and so I've been comparing the water vapor uh, quantities that we see in our spectrometer uh, to uh, a bunch of satellite measurements and, and some other instruments that are there. Uh, other people are measuring ozone uh, and a lot of related compounds because that particular question is, is very connected with a lot of atmospheric chemistry. So we've got to look at a lot of the uh, you know, nitrogen compounds and, 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 and see how those trends are, are giving us an idea as the chemistry going on uh, for that. Um, there's a lot of greenhouse gas measurements going on. Uh, a colleague of mine focuses in, uh, on methane, which is uh, a potent greenhouse gas. And uh, while we do have satellites, uh, we need to ensure that the satellites are working appropriately. And so some of what motivates us to go up, uh, specifically in the winter every time, is to look at ozone depletion. But also we've got a satellite called ACE, which is passing overhead. And so we're down on the ground, and we're kind of both taking measurements and making sure that we're getting the same numbers. Um, that's something that's been talked about. There's uh, this common question. If we've got all these satellites, why do we need people on the ground taking the measurements? And, and there's a couple points there. One, the satellites can't see all the way to the surface. And, and two, just to make sure the satellites are working correctly, and that's really important. Yeah, that, that was going to be my, my next question. Sorry, Nicole. Go ahead. Um, was the, exactly that. So. You know, what is the value of actually being there? Um, and and you, you started to touch on that, which is awesome. And then the other thing is is the seasonal value. So, I mean, if somebody yeah. said to me, you're, you're going to go to the Arctic, first thing on my list wouldn't, wouldn't be, hey, you know what? I'll go there in the winter. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it maybe explain a little bit more why it has to be the Arctic and why it has to be the winter. Well, let's start with the winter uh, because there's, there's some interesting science there, uh, specifically in regards to ozone. Uh, so... In the Arctic, uh, during the winter, uh, you don't have any sunlight. It's, it's dark 24 hours a day, and uh, which makes it a lovely time to go. Um, we go at the very end. Uh, yeah, no, no, it, it's 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 very interesting. Everyone has headlamps they go around with uh, to, to make sure they see uh, the details of their instrument. Uh, so we show up and it's dark, and that means that ozone isn't being destroyed. It's actually building up in in the Arctic area because there's no sunlight to destroy it. And then when the sun first hits, uh, sunlight uh, gets a lot of chemistry moving. And, uh, and some of this chemistry that we're interested in uh, concerns ozone depletion. And so we're there right before this starts to happen. And then when the sun starts to come through into the atmosphere, then we start to see these trends and, and how the chemistry goes on. And, and we can kind of watch this all happen. And by the time we leave, uh, it's about 12 hours of sunlight. And so there's this dramatic everyday increase in how much sunlight we've got. And then we expect to see this ongoing chemistry and, and throughout the campaign while we're there. And then it's, it becomes sunlight 24 hours a day, of course, during the summer. And at least in previous years, uh, to touch on you know when we go, that's the intensive phase. We've got a team. Uh, this year it was seven people uh, that went in to, to run everything. Typically, they set it up so everything's running really well. And then a small team of a couple, uh, we call them operators, stay there. And then ideally, we, we've tried to keep people there year-round so that we do get year-round measurements. But we go up 
you have to send specialists up, uh, and that's what the team is. And, and every once in a while, if something breaks or something happens, we, we have to send that individual up to the, to the Arctic to fix it and to, and to work it out or to install something new. Uh, the year-round operations have ended because of funding. Uh, that may change. Uh, but for now, it's going to be run on a campaign basis, so people are gearing up and, and there's going to be some work done there during the summer so that we do get that coverage. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's more important for some types of, of molecules than yes. others, but we are trying our best to get a complete view of how things go seasonally, especially important for water vapor, for example. Right. So, so what, what is the time frame, the, the intensive period between 24 hours darkness to, to 12 hours dark light? How, how many yeah. months, how many days? Three weeks. Three, three weeks? You it's go rapid. Complete, wow, okay, that's awesome. I had yeah. no idea. There you go. Yeah, it's fascinating because you, you, know, you start out and the sun will rise at 11.30 in the morning, and the sun will set at 12.30, and then every day <laughs> it's 20 minutes earlier and earlier. But you know, it's, it makes it really easy to see some splendid sunsets and sunrises. <laughs> it's very convenient, you don't have to wake up early. <laughs> that's awesome, thank you. All right, so we're going to take a pause to get a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning at Sheridan Student Shine Brighter. Check out sheridanc.on.ca. So I'm Nicole Tate-Hill. We're back, and we are discussing with Dan Weaver water vapor and climate change. So maybe if I can just bring this back again for a minute for sort of the non-scientist or the student. So when you look at water vapor in climate change and you're talking about analyzing all of the data when you collect with water vapor, what does, what does that indicate to the non-scientist or a young student? Uh, well, uh, something that gets said frequently about global climate models is that it's very difficult uh, to incorporate the influence of water vapor in, into climate models, uh, which is true. It is difficult, and you know the debate has been sometimes misrepresented as saying we, we can't we can kind of dismiss global climate models because they don't incorporate water vapor, which is the most significant um, greenhouse gas. Uh, that's unfair. We we know quite a bit about it, but it changes more rapidly than many other species in the atmosphere. Uh, and we're all very familiar with this. One day it can be very humid and, and rainy, and the next day it can be very dry. So the amount of water vapor, at least, you know, especially locally, can change very quickly. And that makes it difficult for us to measure and keep track of as well, uh, which is why you know, there's a lot of efforts to get a, a solid bunch of data together so that we can understand how the water is, is changing from year to year, going back to an earlier question. And, and changing even throughout a day and, and what these absolute and relative quantities can mean for climate and, and whether it's changing. Uh, for example, consider that uh, warm air can hold more water. So if the air is getting warmer, it's able to hold more water. Uh, if it can hold more water, which is a potent greenhouse gas, then that will in turn uh, create more warming. Uh, so mm -hmm. this becomes a feedback effect yeah, that yeah. is very significant for the global climate. So if we're going to get these models right, we really need to get water uh, vapor right. And so this is something that's a, a big area of research right now. And, and I, I think a lot's coming together, though. And just it speaks to that long-term need for for data from year to year because even even the simple explanation of you know some days are humid and some days are drier and it's the, the, the temperature is, for example, different. That talks about the, the variation in weather from day to day, but then that also speaks that we need a long-term understanding over decades of how water vapor changes and, and then how yes. that plays out long-term. So, I mean, it, it, it backs up your case completely. The other thing that I, I'm always trying to make connections to, to you know, science for, for students and high school science and that sort of thing, and I was really interested in what you talked about, the, the importance of sunlight on ozone. And it never really yes. occurred to me before how, how ozone sort of builds up and then depletes in a seasonal way. And it almost reminded me of the, of the discussion of Arctic sea ice, how it builds up in the winter and then melts mm -hmm. in the summertime. Yeah. Um, how would you then sort of explain maybe the importance of, of light on driving chemical reactions to, say, a high school student? It's difficult to put simply. Uh, but it, <laughs> but but 
many chemical reactions simply don't happen without sunlight. And, and, that's, and that's where this comes from. So if there's no reaction to, to destroy ozone, it stays. And as soon as we get sunlight, we start to get reactions that destroy it and destroy it more. And the more sunlight there is, uh, the more potential there is for these reactions to proceed. There is a limit, of course. It doesn't continue throughout the summer. Eventually, you reach an equilibrium where you've got lots of sunlight, and that's no longer limiting. So I guess, I, I think in the curriculum, they might, they might talk about um, things that limit chemical reactions. Uh, and, and that's something that, that so I think can be brought into it. Can we talk specifically about this particular reaction now? Is there other things involved, or is it just ozone as an O3 molecule, which is a simple molecule being broken down by, what is it, UV that breaks it down, or is it something else? Like, is it that simple, or is it more complicated in terms of the reaction? There's a lot of layers that you can get into uh, with, with ozone chemistry. Uh, and, and one other question that we commonly get that will relate into this is, is why the polar regions? Um, why, why the Arctic? And then again, why last year did we see the ozone hole? Uh, and, and part of the difference is temperatures. Uh, and so Antarctica is colder than the Arctic. Uh, and there's some reasons behind that, uh, geography related uh, partially. And because it's so cold in Antarctica every, every, every year, uh, you get uh, these special kinds of clouds form. They're called polar stratospheric clouds, and they provide a surface. And so uh, m most people are familiar that, that chlorine radicals uh, from CFCs and, and such molecules destroy ozone. Well, they can, they can be taken out. So some chemical reactions result in CFCs being kind of neutralized. Uh, and those species uh, can react on these clouds. It provides a surface. And then they can release the, uh, the CFCs again. And, and so you can, you can get them back out. So if it's really cold, you get a special set of circumstances that significantly enhance ozone destruction through these radical pathways, uh, such as with, with chlorine. Um, in the Arctic, it was very, very cold last year. And it was so cold that we actually saw likely the formation of these special clouds, which provide a surface for these special reactions that we don't normally see. And that led to a whole great deal of, uh, of ozone depletion, uh, which might tie into another question. Wait, I thought you said that global warming making things warmer. But that's near the surface. It, it's one of these interesting things where the surface will get warmer, but the high altitudes in the atmosphere will, will get a bit colder, um, which is quite interesting and has the effect of, well, are we going to start to see very low temperatures in the stratosphere more frequently in the Arctic? And if so, are we going to start to see more of these yeah. uh, other chemical reactions? And I, It does become very complicated. So I, I was at school last week talking to them about ozone chemistry, and I tried to keep it fairly simple. Uh, you can go as deep as you want, really. Where, where is the ozone coming from in the first place? That, I mean, it, it's being re replenished at, at some level. So what, what's the other half of the cycle? Uh, right. So, I, and, and you know, high school teachers could probably go into the first explanation of how this worked. It's called the Chapman cycle, uh, and it, it predicted, uh, you know, how this reacted. It's basically cycling back and forth between O3, which is ozone, and, and, and O2. Uh, so you naturally get O3 broken down by UV rays, and then it will naturally reform. There is a, a source of extra oxygen atoms in the stratosphere uh, from a couple different chemical sources, and if they just happen to, to, to collide with, with O2, they can recreate that, that ozone. So it's a matter of keeping that balance, and what we've done is by introducing these, these chlorine radicals, the CFCs and other chemicals, we've disrupted that balance. And then by changing the temperatures, uh, warmer at the surface, colder in the stratosphere, we've allowed for new chemical reactions and, and again, disrupting that balance. That's a, that's a great answer. I, I'm going to have to bow out. I really do appreciate you coming on. Uh, it was great to see uh, Colin and Nicole. Dan, thanks again for your time, and I'll see everybody next week. Thanks, Thomas. Bye. All right, so I guess we can continue on. Um, so I have a question for you, Dan. You know, a lot of um, a lot of the feedback that I've been getting from students in some of our programs is that they really like talking about things that they hear in the news. They really like asking experts about it because you know, news in itself has political undertones, and everything can be contradictory. Yes. So, what do you say? To
to kids who hear that climate change isn't happening, that it's a lie, that it's something that's cyclical, that you know global warming is made up? Wh what do you have to say to things like that? I think it's a wonderful opportunity <clears throat> to really look at the arguments that are being put forward and then look at the arguments that are, are out there to, to take the other side and to really critically think about which is more credible. Uh, there are very few, if any, credible scientists out saying that climate change is not real. Uh, there are people with PhDs that claim to be experts, <coughs> but start reading their bios. You know, some of the well-known people are economists, or they're in the mining industry, or they're being funded by companies uh, with interests. So. It, I think it's an excellent exercise in critical thinking uh, and looking at what the science says. Uh, we understand the properties of gases like methane, like CO2, and, and one can construct fairly, fairly simple uh, demonstrations in the classroom to, to show these properties. Uh, and, and one of them being if you, if you put in uh, sunlight, they'll absorb the sunlight and, and re-emit it. And, and if you release these gases into the atmosphere, they naturally occur. But if we release more of them, uh, sunlight will, will come in and, and, and radiation will, will come off the earth and it'll be absorbed by and, and re-emitted and it'll get trapped there. I mean, these are actually fairly fundamental properties that are easily tested uh, in a lab or in a classroom even. It's It's... It's, it's difficult to credibly discredit uh, that. Uh, so I think it's an opportunity for students to explore the issue and, and to learn about what's being said. I don't see controversy as a bad thing. I, I think it really plays to the point where don't just believe what you read because it can be very misleading. And, and so I think it's as, as, as important to talk about in a science classroom as it is in a, is a, in a media or an English classroom because it's got that connection about thinking about what you're reading and who's saying it and why. I think that's brilliant. I think you've hit the nail right on the head that students need to be aware that just because someone has letters behind their name does not mean that everything they say is necessarily credible to the topic that they're speaking to and that there are also other motivations and critical thinking, particularly in science, is one of your most valuable skills. So yeah. Colin, how do you feel that this all ties in at the high school level? Oh, are you kidding me? Um, I mean, <laughs> this is what we try and do, right? I mean, there's, there's <laughs> The whole concept of being scientifically literate is one that's you know near and dear to me, and it, it's not science is not a body of knowledge where you just simply go and learn stuff that's already been learned. It, it's you need to learn what's already been learned, and then think about it and apply it, and consider what's what's now being learned. Consider ways to learn new things, ask questions that maybe haven't been asked before, right? Uh, and that's what we try and do in, in our high schools is get kids to think right through those things. There's a bit of a danger sometimes in finding that. Uh, uh, presenting, say, a controversial issue as being equal weight, and you have to make a decision yeah. one way or the other. But, uh, but really what, th what Dan says is, is bang on, whereas if you actually look at the process uh, of science and where the credible evidence comes from and what is credible evidence, you very quickly realize that it's not a balanced issue. you got some people against and some people for it. That, you know, the, the, the vast, vast majority of the credible evidence says that it's real and it's happening. And so if you can get to that conclusion based on what you're learning in, in how you're thinking then I think you're doing uh, you're doing a good job as a teacher and you're you're learning how to think as a student mm -hmm. wonderful uh, do you have any last comments for Dan no just I was looking at the uh, climate data for Eureka and uh, my hats off to you my friend for spending a month up there it uh, <laughs> it's a very cold looking place <laughs> <laughs> but very but, cool it, but it's wonderful to see a part of the country, an expansive Absolutely. part of the country that, ver that few people get to see. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, in one way jealous that you were, you were there, and in another way I just go, wow, it's really cold. But no, you're absolutely right. And uh, like I said, I, I hope this, uh, this long-term funding for Pearl sorts itself out and that uh, um, mm. you know, cooler heads prevail, so to speak, and that mm. it, it doesn't just become a, a race for yearly snapshot funding that we can continue some of that other stuff. And I know that's, that's a bigger picture issue than, than either you or I can deal with today, but uh, hopefully we'll get some results long term. So thanks again for coming on, Dan. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. If anyone wants to see photos from the trip, just type uh, ACE Arctic Campaign into Google, and our website will come up. we got lots of photos and, and tidbits that they can uh, take a look at.
Wonderful. Well, thanks, that's man. great. Thank yeah. you very much, Dan, and thanks, you know, as Canadians, for you doing that important research because I know you wouldn't catch me up there. So <laughs> we're so happy that you're up there doing all of that. It's very important research. And thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Well, thanks for watching This Week in Science and Education. We'll see you next time.